When I tell people that a particular scientific theory is wrong or has issues, well, the automatic thing that comes into their minds is, well, wait a minute, how can that be? Somebody would have said something by now. I call that the smarter monkey fallacy. And the 27th rule of acquisition says that the belief that somebody should have said something by now is the reason why no one will ever say anything ever. Okay, but we'll come back to that. We'll go more into the smarter monkey fallacy in a moment. Who am I? My name's Robert Distinti. I'm an electrical engineer with over 30 years experience. And through my journeys and travels through science and engineering, I have learned that there's a lot of broken paradigms in science and a lot of myths and fallacies among the people that are supposedly highly trained in the field. Now, don't get angry with me. Just listen to what I have to say. You're going to see what I'm saying is actually true. This is the introduction video to the fourth edition of Distinti's Scientific Rules of Acquisition. We're just going to call them the Rules of Acquisition for short. And so what are the Rules of Acquisition? The Rules of Acquisition are 33 aphorisms or aphorisms with over 100 support sayings uh, that aid technological achievement by uh, identifying widely held fallacies and reinforcing proper paradigms, uh, guarding against mental traps, mindsets, and focusing on imperatives. You know, in other words, sometimes we, we're like, we're focused on this is what we have to get. We have to get to the truth. But when we really find out what we really need to get to is utility. And we're going to cover that in the rules of acquisition. And most important thing that we're missing in science, or that we don't really have enough of, are things called tells. What tells are, tells are like in the old gambling days, you know, when the, the person you're playing poker against would have a little scratch to kind of indicate he's bluffing. Well, that's what we needed more of in science, or tells that tell you, hey, you know, if you get an, if you get an ambiguity here, that means you don't, may not have the most fundamental explanation of the phenomenon. That's actually the 17th rule of acquisition, the ambiguity tell. Okay, the rules of acquisition are inspired by Benjamin Franklin, who developed short aphorisms or aphorisms to convey complex ideas within the short and limited attention span of the human mind. You know, that's if you're going to start a revolution. You know, you've got to kind of get a message across with the shortest, sweetest, simplest, most adaptable words possible. And that's what he did. The sound bite, we would call that today. Like, for example, he would say, uh, if we don't all hang together, we will certainly all hang separately. Or the other one, he would say, a penny saved is a penny earned, which is just, you know, frugal things for life. And, of course, the famous one is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I know a lot of you say that's attributed to Einstein, but I think I found that Einstein actually got that from Franklin. But either way, it doesn't matter. It's, it's an aphorism that allows us to, you know, put things into a simple context so we can identify what might be a stupid thing to do. You, you keep trying something over and over and over, and you keep getting the same result, you know, it kind of should tell you that, okay, time to move on. So I got the name for the rules of acquisition from the Ferengi of Star Trek. And the Ferengi 74th rule of acquisition is knowledge equals profit. Okay, now this is the fourth edition of the rules of acquisition. In the third edition of the rules of acquisition, we started adding paradigms. Paradigms are basically little sayings of what science is, like science is monkey see, monkey do. Okay, those simple ones are still in the rules of acquisition, but some of the, the more advanced ones that we're really in need of are, became an entirely different set of videos called Distinti's New Science Paradigms. For example, the 17th rule of acquisition showed us that our definition of energy is ambiguous, and we need a newer definition of energy that isn't ambiguous. Okay, check out the fourth video of the Distinti's New Science Paradigms and you'll see the introduction to the new definition of energy, which isn't ambiguous. Okay, and the new fourth edition of the Rules of Acquisition have been expanded to include the language from the newly expanded Distinti's New Science Paradigms. And like, for example, one of the things we talk about a lot in the uh, Rules of Acquisition is a thing called footprint. What the footprint is, is a, a footprint is our capabilities, our time in the universe, the places, how far we can travel in the universe, how precisely we can measure things. Things we can measure, like, you know, 200, 300 years ago, they couldn't measure radiation. You know, now we know of it, so we can measure it. So there's a lot of things that we might not be able to measure 
that we don't know how to measure yet that one day as our footprint expands we're going to bump into and say hey there's this other weirdo energy that we never knew about okay and usually when our footprint expands that's where we find the counter examples for example uh, our committee's principle that the buoyant force acting on a ship is equivalent to the weight of the water displaced okay fine that was uh, an irrefutable law of science up until our footprint expanded such that steamships could get up enough thrust, enough propulsion, that they're moving through the water with such speed that a new effect that no one knew about called hogging occurs, where the ship actually sinks down into the water due to its velocity. And it's only again when our footprint expanded that we came to the counterexample of our committee's principle. So don't assume that because something we have explains everything we know now, that it's going to survive when our footprint expands. Hey, get down. All right, don't get down. Um, all right, so let's get back to the smarter monkey fallacy. Because put yourself into the shoes of somebody who's well-versed in science and a total believer in the existing paradigms. And you run an experiment on relativity, and that experiment comes up at, at, with a counterexample to relativity. What is the first thing you are going to do? You're going to say, well, gee, I, I can't, you know, there can't be a mistake with relativity. Somebody would have said something by now, so assume that you made the error. Now, maybe you did. The odds are you probably did. But let's say you go and check your data, you check your experimental equations, you check everything, and you still come up with that it doesn't agree. Well, you're going to sit there and say, well, it, it, it can't be the theory because somebody would have said something by now, and for all intents and purposes, you're going to leave it and go on. Okay? Now, if you decide, well, there is really a problem with the theory of relativity, well, you're not going to come forward because you know there's going to be backlash. People are going to say, oh, you obviously did something wrong because obviously somebody would have said something by now. And so people, without even looking at your data, are going to say you're an idiot. And you don't need that kind of backlash. The other problem is, if you do put out your data, there may actually be the smarter monkey out there that's going to look at your thing and say, oh, no, you made a simple mistake. You didn't account for the protons and the da 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 something you didn't even think of. And then you're going to look like a fool to everybody. So you're going to lose no matter what you do. So you're going to say absolutely nothing. Okay, you've got to be a crazy moron like me to come forward and say there's a problem with relativity. And there's very simple problems with relativity. I mean, consider that the thing they show all the school kids is that heavy mass rolling around on this foam rubber as it depresses and deforms the fabric of space-time. Okay, well, my friends, I'm an engineer. If you deform something as it roll, you roll something, and it's deforming something as it's go, it'll work in it. If you're working it, you've got to expend energy. If you're expending energy, then that object that is, has forward motion in that medium is eventually going to come to rest. It's going to lose its forward energy, its, its kinetic energy, because you're working space-time. That's a little problem that you relativistic grease monkeys have to figure out. Actually, it's going to save your ass I'm not going to tell you how, you're going to figure it out. Because you're going to find out that it is, in fact, true. Okay, so let's go on to the sixth rule of acquisition. Sixth rule of acquisition is the prior knowledge trap. You see, we have a problem that we try to judge everything in terms of what we already know. And that could be very limiting. For example, if, if all you know is fire, then everything that generates heat and light, you're going to interpret in terms of fire. That it's made of fire, that it's combustion. You say, oh, we would never do that. We're good. Well, my friends, this is a book, a textbook from Princeton University, written by C.A. Young, Ph.D., FUD, uh, professor of astronomy at Princeton University, 1898. Page 6. And in page 6, he talks about the sun as if it's a being. He's trying to personalize it. That's all he's doing. Okay, and on page 6... Okay, at the top of page 6, and to his true dimensions, but the heat of his rays is obvious, and long before the days of telescopes and thermometers led to the conclusion that he is nothing more or less than an enormous ball of fire. Okay, and if we go to page 8, okay, they t he talks about how much anthracite coal is the equivalent of needed to be burned. And if we do the calculations, he says, that means the sun, according to this model, is 6,000 years old. Okay. But to his credit, we go to page 311. 
I'm not going to read 3.11 to you. I will put an image of it on the video so you can pause it and read it. Basically what he says on page 3.11, he's very clever. He says, oh, wait a minute, if the ball were a burning ball of coal, it would have lost 30% of its light intensity since the days of antiquity. But based on where the, the wine, the grapevines are for growing uh, wine, and where the olive groves are in Europe, those, those are still in the same places that they were in the days of antiquity. And so he correctly concludes that the luminous energy from the sun hasn't appreciably changed since antiquity. And then the question is, well, what keeps the fire going? And then they start talking about other uh, possible causes, which are still based on mechanics that they knew of the day. They didn't even not consider atomic energy because atomic energy was still this marginal fringe crazy stuff in laboratories at that time. Okay, now, if this had knowledge back then of genetics, they would have said, oh, well, the plants would have just genetically modified and adapted to the lesser energy, and that would have blown this theory right up. So it shows you that not only does your lack of knowledge hinder your ability to do science, but your actual knowledge you have is going to color the way you view what you see. Okay, and that's the rule of acquisition, prior knowledge trap. Prior knowledge is problematic. The third rule of acquisition is the utility fallacy. Just because we can do all these great things, we got computers and airplanes, doesn't mean we know what we're doing. All it means is we can mimic well. For example, we have this thing called Coulomb's law. It's really not a law. All it is is some guy made some measurements of charged spheres, measured the distance between them, measured the forces on them. He wrote all that data down and they found out that it fits an inverse square law with a big old honking constant of relation. Really, people, all it is is an empirical model. An empirical model is a model based on observed phenomenon that, and then he curve fit it to an algebraic expression. It doesn't explain what this magic force is that travels from charge A to charge B. It doesn't explain how fast it gets there. Okay, it's a very limited model, but we've made great use of it. We've done fantastic, wonderful things with it. It's not a law, it's just an empirical model. Okay, but we think because we can do all these wonderful things that we're smart, we know what we're doing. We don't know crap about electric fields. We don't know anything. Matter of fact, in ethereal mechanics, I'm getting to the point where I'm ready to say it's really a magnetic field in disguise. I'm not quite there yet. Okay, and I mean, consider that we use fire for the better part of 20,000 years, all the while thinking, is it an element? You know, what it is? What is it? We don't know. We just found out a couple uh, hundred years ago that it's a chemical reaction. Okay, so don't get blinded by the fact that we can do all these wonderful things that we actually understand what it is we're using. Okay, um, and like for example, um, that we have a, a, the... There's another rule of acquisition called the poor efficiency tell, which says if we pretty much get below 10% efficiency in any technology, then our models that underlie that theory are garbage. Okay, like for example, nuclear power. We hardly get any energy out of it. We get like 2% efficiency out of a nuclear power plant. Old incandescent light bulbs are 2% efficient. Now with the new LED technology, we're in the ballpark of 40%. Okay, because there's all these tells that tell us how to, to look, to say, hey, if we're only getting 2% efficiency, we have to double check. We probably don't know what we're doing. We're probably still in the caveman days of this technology. Okay, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the first rule of acquisition, which is the rule of acquisition that is the, the, the rule of acquisition that they're, uh, they all, that uh, guides them all. It's the first rule of acquisition is the correct answers prove nothing except utility. In other words, there's a myth out there that people think, well, if I come up with a theory and I have an experiment and the experiment matches the theory, the theory is a valid, true uh, law of the universe. Wrong. Wrong. I'm going to show you in the video of the first rule of acquisition, I can get correct answers from complete fantasy. Now, if you think, oh, you're just being a, a fuddy-duddy and uh, you're just trying to be a contrarian. No, I'm not. The, fir the first rule of acquisition is actually not mine. It, it's, I've just put it into a nice little sense. The first rule of acquisition actually comes from a guy called Karl Popper, who said, logically, no number of positive outcomes at the level of experimental testing can confirm a scientific theory. But a single counterexample can, can show a theory to be false. I'm trying to read that through the paper backwards. That's why I kind of stuttered. And if you think, oh, well, he's just a quack. He's just a one-off. 
Well, here's your buddy, Albert, Albert Einstein. No amount of experimentation can prove me right. I think he's talking about relativity. However, a single experiment can prove me wrong. Well, I just gave you one. I got about three others that show that there's deficiencies in the theory of relativity. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Okay? That's fine. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. The point is, is we've got to let people come forward if they find counterexamples without persecuting them. Because the sooner we can find the counterexamples, the sooner we can adopt newer and better theories. If we hold on to these theories and we, we suppress people coming forward with counterexamples by blacklisting them or whatever, whatever, we're suppressing science. We basically turn science into a religion. Stop it. Okay, so I know some of you are intrigued and others will feel threatened and become angry because you're going to be like, oh, you're just some kind of guy, blah, 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 everybody, blah, blah, blah. You know, if you were right, somebody would have said something by now. You're going to come up with all the angry things because you're going to be, feel a little threatened. But those who are reasonable and can think for themselves will find that these aphorisms, both are aphorisms, both will be helpful and liberating. Okay. So, and finally, let me give you the, uh, one of the paradigms of science I haven't released yet, which is called science is monkey see, monkey do. You see, people, what we do is we observe something like fire. We try to mimic it. Okay? All of our mathematical models are basically taking our experimental data and mimicking them with mathematical models or computer models. There's no guarantee that even though our mathematical or computer models match our observations, that they're a true representation of the underlying mechanism. All they are are mimics. Say, so all we ever have are models that mimic nature. These models were not handed to us by God on stone tablets, and I often wonder, if he's God, why is he writing on stone tablets? Why is he, like, printed on a plate of undestructium or something like that? Okay, and these models can and will be made obsolete as our footprint in the universe expands. We've got to look for that, hope for that, use the models we have now to expand our footprint, and then when we detect the counterexamples, then we have to revise the theories as necessary to include all the observations, and then according to the gateway feedback paradigm, which is in the new science paradigms, we have to take that new model and feed it back into all other branches of science to see what is disturbed. We don't do that. We don't do that. You can see because in the general theory of relativity, okay, they came up with a new way that bends light. It's called gravity. But in special relativity, they accounted for all the ways that stellar aberration occur. And then they put that away thinking, oh, we're done here. And then now they come up with a new way that bends light, and they haven't fed that back to see, well, how does that disturb special relative? Maybe they did. I'm not aware of it. Okay? I'm just saying that I don't think they did. Maybe they did. I, there's so many things out there I may not know, but I don't think that occurred. And if, if I'm wrong, please correct me. This is good. We all learn. Making mistakes is not a problem. Okay? So what I'd like to do now is... There's going to be a lot more on the first rule of acquisition video, which will follow this. But I'd like to thank my patronage on my Patreon site. If you go to www.etherealmechanics.com, you can help support this scientific endeavor. I would appreciate it. It helped me get more time, get more people, hopefully, to start doing production, um, whatever. And we have a lot of different levels of patronage. If you just want to support the cause, you can sign up for a supporter uh, patronage account, which will... It's anywhere from $1 to $9, and you'll get all the public uh, uh, announcements of what's going on and all the free posts. Anybody that's $10 and above can see all the videos for patrons. Uh, $10 to $19. From $20 to $29, that's first class. You get all the PDFs when they become available, and there's engineer class and bridge officer class, which helps steer the project because... One of the things I have found is I am not good at promoting. I, 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 am, I really am not good at promoting stuff. And I'm trying to figure out how to get better. And if people can give me guidance on how to get this stuff into the mainstream, I'd really appreciate that. But anyway, thank you. Thank you all for my patrons. Um, and this is the first week of 2018. And good luck in the new year, everybody. Thank you.